Great Bell. In the late 15th century, Myanmar was an enlightened nation. Under the reign of King Damazeti, a former Buddhist monk, the country reached a pinnacle in antiquity during the Golden Age, complete with treasures to match. Cast in the 15th century, the great Damazeti Bell was, according to popular legend, placed alongside the gleaming gold Shwedagon Pagoda, the most sacred Buddhist site in Myanmar. Reported to be the largest bell ever made, the Great Bell is said to measure roughly 20 feet by 13 feet and was cast from 294 tons of metal, including silver, gold, copper, and tin. It was engraved with a script described by a visiting foreigner as indecipherable language covering the entire surface. In the 16th century, European explorers began to make contacts in Lower Burma, and the Portuguese warlord and mercenary Felipe de Brito e Nicole was one of them. This adventurer worked with the rival Arakanese culture and led a force that sacked the cities of Siriam and Pegu, the capital of Lower Myanmar. He was appointed by the king of Arakan as the governor of Siriam, and by 1600 had extended his power across Myanmar. After declaring independence from the Arakan king, in 1608, de Brito and his men removed the Damazetti Bell from the Shwedagon Pagoda, intending to melt it down to make a massive cannon. After rolling it down a hill, they placed it on a waiting raft in Pazunduang Creek. Unfortunately, the bell was far heavier than de Brito could have imagined, and while traveling along the river, the bell disappeared under the waters and has never been seen since. Many rescue attempts to retrieve the bell have been unsuccessful. There are at least three other shipwrecks in that area, and with the water muddy and the seabed soft, there's near zero visibility. The Great Bell is a significant part of Myanmar's history and religion, and after its disappearance, many civic and government leaders believe that if the bell can be found and recovered, it will usher in a new age of prosperity for Myanmar. Ark of the Covenant For centuries and centuries, the Ark of the Covenant and its whereabouts have been shrouded in a mystery many have tried to crack. The legendary artifact is an elaborate and gilded case, said to hold the original Ten Commandments written by Israelites. Biblical accounts describe it as a wooden chest covered in pure gold and with an elaborate lid in the shape of two large golden angels. There are many stories surrounding the seemingly magical powers of the Ark within the Hebrew Bible. In one story, the Jordan River stopped flowing and remained still for a group of priests to cross with the Ark. In other stories, the Ark is taken with the Israelites to battle, where the powers help them to defeat their enemies. Some even describe how when the Israelites besieged Jericho, they carried the Ark around the city for a week, blowing trumpets until on the seventh day, the walls fell, allowing easy conquest. The Ark was moved around frequently, until it was settled permanently in Jerusalem, in the innermost chamber of the Temple of King Solomon. Consequently, the Ark vanished when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem in 587 BC. Whether it was destroyed, captured, or hidden, nobody knows, although there are many theories as to where it could have ended up. The Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church claims to possess the Ark in the ancient holy city of Aksum. The Ark is kept under guard in the city's treasury, although church authorities say only one man, the guardian of the Ark, is allowed to see it. With researchers never permitted to study the Ark for authenticity, the validity of this claim is uncertain. Others claim the Ark was hidden within a warren of passages beneath the First Temple of Jerusalem before the Babylonians managed to destroy it in 586 BC. However, again, this is unable to be verified due to the sacred nature of the site preventing access and research. The recent translation of an ancient Hebrew text, Masachet Kalim, or Treatise of the Vessels, has recently been translated into English for the first time. James de Villa, a professor at the University of St. Andrews who translated the text, claims that the treasures of King Solomon's temple were, quote, concealed by a number of Levites and prophets, with it stopping short of revealing the exact location of the Ark, 
stating that it, quote, shall not be revealed until the day of the coming of the Messiah, son of David. The true location of the Ark of the Covenant, if it truly exists, is likely to remain a mystery. Treasure of the Young Anates. Somewhere deep inside the Young Anates mountain range, between the Andes and the Amazon, is said to exist a huge Incan hoard of gold, silver, platinum, and electrum artifacts. The remote mountain range lies at 2,500 to 4,500 meters altitude and is seldom visited. The story starts in 1532. Following a lengthy civil war with his brother, Huascar, Incan Emperor Atahualpa was captured by Francisco Pizarro, a commander of the Spanish conquest forces. Pizarro agreed to release Atahualpa when he offered him an incredible amount of gold for his safe release. Shortly after, the gold would be collected from all over the Incan Empire by the emperor's trusted confidant, Ruminahui. Growing suspicious, Pizarro believed that this activity meant the army was actually planning to gather forces to liberate Atahualpa from his captivity. Atahualpa was promptly killed by strangulation and being burned at the stake. Upon hearing the news, Ruminahui ordered the gold to be hidden in an uninhabited area of northern Ecuador, and although the commander was detained and fiercely questioned by the Spanish, he never revealed the location. There's a spotty history in the years that followed Atahualpa's death of those who made the journey into the depths of the Yanganate's mountain range in search of the treasures. Only 50 years after Atahualpa's death, a Spaniard named Valverde is said to have become rich after being led to the gold by his Incan bride's family. When he died, he left directions to its location to the Spanish king, a cryptic guide called the Derrotero de Valverde. The tale of Emperor Atahualpa was lost for hundreds of years until it was rediscovered when English botanist Richard Spruce traveled to Ecuador and uncovered Valverde's map in 1850. Treasure seeker Barth Blake followed up on Spruce's discovery when in 1886 he supposedly was the last person to find the gold. In one letter he wrote, quote, there are thousands of gold and silver pieces of Inca and pre-Inca handcraft, the most beautiful goldsmith works you are not able to imagine. He detailed life-size human figurines, birds and other animals, flowers and corn stalks, as well as, quote, the most incredible jewelry and golden vases full of emeralds. But Blake claimed, quote, I could not remove it alone, nor could thousands of men. Whether Atahualpa's fortune still sits in the hills of Yanganates or not, the mystery of its treasures continues to bewilder to this day, with many still risking their lives in pursuit of the Incan gold. Honjo Masamune In the world of weaponry, the Japanese samurai sword stands as a pinnacle of craftsmanship. Japanese swordsmiths have been crafting these delicate and deadly blades for well over a millennium, but none have matched the legendary Honjo Masaname. Goro Nyudo Masaname, the renowned medieval crafter of the Honjo Masaname, rose to prominence in the 13th century with his masterful sword making, and in turn, so did the samurai warriors he made them for. Masaname discovered that he could create weapons made entirely of steel to improve their strength and flexibility. By 1287, Emperor Fushimi proclaimed Masaname as his chief swordsmith. The Honjo Masaname sword received its name from the prominent general Honjo Shigenaga who owned it. Shigenaga led his troops into battle in 1561 and fought another man of similar rank whose sword cleaved Shigenaga's helmet in half. However, the sword did not kill the general and he fought back, instantly killing his counterpart. Per Japanese tradition, Shigenaga took the sword of his fallen enemy. Considered one of the best swords to have ever been crafted, the Honjo Masaname has lived a colorful life over the past seven centuries. After Shigenaga, the blade passed through a series of hands and eventually landed in the hand of the Tokugawa family, who held it for centuries. During World War II, the sword was still a prized possession of the family. That all changed when atomic destruction brought an end to Japan's involvement in the war and they surrendered to the U.S. The U.S. decreed that all Japanese families must turn over their weapons, 
including the samurai swords that were long-standing heirlooms of many families. The Tokugawa family relinquished their famous sword to the U.S. military. It has never been seen since. Many believe it was given to an American soldier, who presumably took it back to the U.S. as a spoil of war. The famous and greatest of all of the samurai swords has yet to be located, and will likely remain hidden for time to come. Dead Sea Copper Scroll Treasure The Copper Scroll is one of the famous Dead Sea Scrolls, found in 1947 by Bedouin nomadic Arab tribes who were searching caves overlooking the Dead Sea. It wasn't until March 14, 1952, that archaeologists uncovered a copper scroll hidden amongst them, on a shelf carved into the wall, made of copper mixed with about 1% of tin. The copper scroll was found in two sections that would have been eight foot long, and unlike the other scrolls, it is not a literary work, but a list of 64 places where various items of gold and silver were buried or hidden. It's difficult to ascertain the value of what is described in the scrolls, but it was estimated in 1960 that the total would top $1 million, with others suggesting the treasures could be worth as much as $3 billion today. The scroll was also written in a language different from the other scrolls, in a style similar to Mishnaic Hebrew. The Mishnah is the written collection of oral traditions, known as the Oral Torah. Between 1994 and 1996, the Copper Scroll was extensively photographed, x-rayed and cleaned by experts, dating it to around 70 AD. Most likely, the treasure described in the scroll came from Jerusalem's Second Temple, built between 516 BC and 70 AD. It was the largest religious shrine in the entire Roman Empire, and visitors were required to leave half a shekel as an offering, which over time accumulated and became known as the Temple Treasure. In 1962, Dead Sea Scroll scholar John Allegro followed clues in the Copper Scroll and excavated several places mentioned in it, to no avail. There are those who have suggested that the treasure never actually existed, that the Copper Scroll is simply a work of fiction. Even if the treasure did exist, we do not know where it came from or who it belonged to. Thank you for watching Dark Five. Don't forget to like and subscribe to continue exploring the greatest mysteries of this world and beyond. Your support and engagement help my videos get seen by even more people, and let me know if there are any other ancient mysteries you'd like me to investigate.